hero is fox hunt sabotage people, <laughs> the saboteurs in the UK. And uh, you can, uh, so okay, fox hunting is illegal in England, but sabotaging a fox hunt is also illegal. If, you, if you're a sab and you, and you <laughs> if you sabotage a hunt, you can be put in jail, and they get put in jail, they get fined. But the fox hunters can go out in their finery and all of their hounds and say that they're exercising their hounds for the day. And they go out, you know, like 20 of these guys on horses with the hounds. And they're exercising and training their dogs, but they're not hunting. But of course, the dogs catch foxes, but they say that it was by accident. We didn't ask them to catch the fox. It's just what happens when we're out exercising our dogs. So, and they're protected because, like, they know the police and stuff. It's a really interesting thing. Has anyone ever taken part in a, in a sab? Oh my gosh, it's incredible. Like the, all the activists are out there with maps and cars and they're running through fields to catch them. And the cops are everywhere because they know the sabs are out and they're trying to catch the sabs. Everyone's trying to catch someone, but the <laughs> in this picture, on this day, no foxes were killed because of the sabs out there interfering with the hunt with the exercising of the dogs. <laughs> I keep going to the southern US because of these awful things happening. This was at the BP oil spill. And again, people from all over the world actually went down to the oil spill to see how they could help um, the environment and how they could help the animals. This is a group who went down and set up and they de-oiled the birds. They would go out in boats and they might only catch a few birds a day, but it was worth it. It was worth it because they, they respect these individuals. They see these animals as individuals. It was really great. And so this, these are brown pelicans who have been de-oiled and um, they're convalescing here behind this, uh, in this pool area. And then they actually flew the birds to the other side of the country and released them so that they would be safe from the oil spill. It was really amazing. They ended up de-oiling thousands and thousands of birds. And there's great people like Sea Shepherd volunteers who go out there. Um, I, um, I was with them for, for three months and it was really amazing to see all the work they were doing. Um, this, on, on this particular year, they, um, they, they only, they were, the Japanese whaling fleet only hunted and killed 500 whales, which is a lot, but that was half of their quota. So, ah, little success. Well, we all know this stuff. <laughs> How can we all help animals? <laughs> I'm surrounded by compassionate people here. I know you're all working really hard for this, but this is also a fun part for me, <laughs> is I get to, you know, inspire. We can eat. We can not eat animals, <laughs> not take part in the system. We can eat our veggies specifically. This dog ate the whole celery. <laughs> he did. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> now, how many of you guys know about Guelph Pig Save? So can you tell me, is it, is it, has it started or? We're looking for people. I, I, I just joined, so, but Guelph Pig Save is looking for people. So if you want to help us with this project, we'd love to Facebook. And there'll be vigils or uh, how's it going? I'm not sure yet. I'm actually not the one in charge, Okay. I just joined. Uh, well, Toronto Pig Save started two years ago. Now there's Burlington Pig Save, Indiana Pig, Pig Save, Melbourne Pig Save. So it's a growing movement, and we do three vigils a week, and we bear witness to the pigs who are going to slaughter, and we also do things like handing out these uh, coconut vegan bacon sandwiches. And uh, it's very, very positive. It's love-driven fully, so there's no anger, there's no yelling at people. And uh, a lot of people have joined this movement, and I understand that there's a Guelph, there's a Guelph chapter now. So do you want to let people know more about it? or? Okay. <laughs> We can celebrate. Celebrate is very important because we can get really down and depressed about all the issues. Do you know this guy? Oh, I just like the shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's really important to celebrate the successes instead of just mourning the, the sad stuff. I learned the hard way <laughs> when I had PTSD and then had therapy, and then it's all good now. <laughs> we can march. We can adopt instead of buy. Does anyone know this woman? I'm trying to find out who she is. I photographed her once, and I have to, it was part of like this thing. She came and went. Of course, very easy to do. 
and we can report cruelty. A lot of us find it really hard to speak up, but it's really amazing what one phone call can do. This was one phone call from a neighbor who didn't want to be identified. They were worried about, you know, repercussions from the from the neighbor, but this dog was chained out there his whole life. And when the investigators went and said, hey, like we can't force you to bring your dog inside, but these are the reasons you should bring your dog inside. And they actually did. They said they listened and they said, well, we really, we really love the dog. And um, subsequent visits later, three of them, the dog was living indoors. So you may not think that a phone call can change much, but it really, really can. It can change an entire life. We can also bear witness to things and then report back and tell everyone we know what we've seen. This is at a mink farm. And a lot of uh, people who are even like, just like amateur photographers can do this easily. Just go and take great photos of animals that need adoption because it's, it'll make the difference between the dog getting adopted or the cat or the ferret or the animal not getting adopted. Good pictures are key. And we can volunteer. We can protest. You do? You know that family? That's so good. <laughs> awesome. So we can protest, and we can protest with humor. Humor is great. This sign says, get me the cluck out of here. And they were, um, they were trying to get Loblaws to uh, use only uh, free range eggs. And I just adore this woman. She's protesting the, the testing of Botox on animals. But I love that of all people, it's her, you know, with her beautiful, beautiful face. Someone in this room is in this next picture. Two of you. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> that was like 10 years ago, are you guys? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Good hair, Izzy. I love it. So building compassionate communities. Uh, it's easy for us to get really angry and worked up. And I'm angry and worked up too. Um, but what I've found in my experience with this is that if you approach everything with Inclusion and community and love, you'll see a lot more changes than doing this to people. Something else we can do, we can use art to, to influence and change. And we can start animal rights clubs. Best way to tackle a problem is to become a part of the solution. Not just for humans, but for animals, because they are also sentient, as we all know, and deserve the respect that we give humans as well. So one last story. Um, <clears throat> hard to know what you're looking at, and this was shot in 2011, but I was at this place, this is Alamogordo, New Mexico, and, and I was there in 2007. And um, where, in 2007, there was a big building there on this location, and that building housed cages, and drugs, and equipment, and it housed chimpanzees, and it housed rats and beagles that were tested on for decades and decades and decades. And when I went back, when I went back in 2011, um, that building was gone, and the place had officially closed down. It's called the Colston Foundation. It's gone now. It's free of animals. And I went back there, and I was strolling around on that site and feeling just like the weight of that, you know, the weight of the, of the, of the wonder, of the change of it, and also the heaviness, um, because that's where Ron lived. That's where Ron spent 30 years of his life, at this hellhole with no windows being tested on. And I walked around, and there was just a slab of, of cement there where the building used to be. And I was walking on it, and there were cracks in the cement, and there was grass growing up in the cracks, and there were even little flowers growing up through the cement. And I you know, really felt the weight of history there and felt the weight of change and felt the promise of change. And um, everything had been cleared away, bulldozed. Everything was gone except for as I walked around. It's really wild. Um, there was a little piece of plastic left over, a piece of debris, and I picked it up, and on it is the word oxygen. And it must have been from the equipment there. And it said oxygen. And I, I was like, oh, it's telling me. It's like history coming back to tell me to breathe and to think of Ron. And that's something I really want everyone to, to take away with them. I mean, from this, there's, there's so many things. But um, 
it's hard, it's hard to know that this stuff is happening and it's, we're up against a lot. You know, we're trying to change the whole world and emancipate all these animals who are suffering. But um, I keep this with me and it says oxygen and it reminds me to breathe. And it takes me back to this place where, you know, there's no longer an animal research facility. And Ron is safe now and things are changing. So if you can take that as well with you, breathe, you know, when, when, th when things are just awful and you're suffering from the animal suffering, think of, think of this story and think of change and think of Ron and how that worked out. And, um, and take a breath because we really need you all. Um, all you compassionate people, we need, the animals need you and we need each other. So um, take care of each other and for the animals. And that's it, guys. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.